Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Benno Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And today's interview is with Julia Cumming and Nick Kivlin of Sunflower Bean. Uh, I first saw, or the first time I saw Sunflower Bean was in Boston in 2019. Uh, I was there on business and they opened up for Interpol. That was a fantastic show. Uh, Sunflower Bean has a new album out now, out May 6th, called Head Full of Sugar. It is fantastic. I love it. Uh, what I enjoyed about this interview was listening to two songwriters from the same band talk about their process. I've interviewed two songwriters who are from different bands or two solo acts, but I think this is the first time I've interviewed two songwriters from the same band, and it was uh, a unique perspective to listen to them talk about how they create separately, how they create together, what happens when they get together. And while you will hear the word organic come up a lot, there's not a lot of structure to the process. I don't think with either of them, there's that sense of, I wake up and I do this and I do this, then I write from X time to X time, then I have lunch and I write some more. There's none of that. There's not a lot of structure. I, I asked them about that and the, the recurring theme was it's very organic. Uh, there's no ritual, not much of a ritual to the process, but they are different enough in their process and when they come together, they complement each other very well. Um, as you'll hear, they go about, th they go about things differently. So when they come together, it's not two people doing the same thing. They do things different enough, and so it's a very good fit. Uh, Coming uh, did say that walking and listening to music is one of, my, one of my favorite activities. And also when I asked her about the, uh, the mundane activities, if mundane activities inspire her, she uh, went in a, little, in a little different direction and talked about uh, quite candidly the role of antidepressants and how they help her. Uh, be creative uh, with Kivlin. Uh, we did talk at the end. I talked with both of them about books. As you'll hear, uh, coming as a big Joan Didion fan, Kivlin loves to listen to audiobooks and finds that to be very inspiring and in listening to the language. So I enjoy this a lot. I hope you do too. And with that, here is my interview with Julia Cumming and Nick Kivlin of Sunflower Bean. Uh, all right. So, Julia, we'll start with you. I always like to ask songwriters uh, outside of songwriting. How much writing, if any, do you do? Journaling, you know, creative writing, anything like that? Yeah, I actually, I do like to write. I like to write, um, I like to write about music. I like to write um, little essays. Um, I do, it is something I'm kind of working on more um, is just like the words on the paper. And I do like journaling and think like morning pages, all that stuff is really um it's really necessary, at least for me, for me to, for, for songwriting. Like I'm, I'm usually only really writing if I am like, I'm only coming up with good stuff. If I'm also, um, writing like morning pages and journaling, cause it is like the best way to just, um, be able to like be in tune with, um, just committing to what is like coming out of your mind. But yeah. So follow up to that as I morning pages, I hear that all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. from songwriters, morning pages, uh, some of them completely separate morning pages, though, from the songwriting process. Others mm -hmm. will go back occasionally, you know, look for song ideas. So are those things separate or does do the morning pages sometimes lead to song ideas? They definitely do. I mean, sometimes I like circle ideas <laughs> that like I, I think I'll, I want to come back to or I think that will be good. But um but definitely not always. I mean, a lot of times morning pages are like, I'm hungry. I'm tired. I don't want to be doing this. I'm over this. My hand is tired. I don't, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, four hours later, a whole song will come to you and you're like, well, that, yeah, that's, those two things are definitely related. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Nick? Any uh, outside of songwriting, do you like to do any type of writing? Absolutely not. I don't write anything down. I never journal. I don't think I've ever journaled in my life. I just talk constantly. And whatever I'm thinking, I end up just saying to the people around me. And then I hope I remember it or that they remember it. 
<laughs> so it's funny because I find that songwriters fall into three categories. Those who journal and love that they do, those who don't journal, but wish <laughs> that they do. And those who don't journal, but never, ever have any desire to start. So I'm guessing it sounds like you're that last category. Yeah, I definitely am. So when you get song ideas, Nick, are they, or, you know, lyrical ideas, or is it the phone that you're going to? I mean, when, when, when these, I, I, I guess I'm curious when songwriters, when those times of inspiration come to them in those inopportune times, are you just reaching for that phone or what? I do a lot of voice memos and I'll do notes app. Like I don't, I don't journal or write anything outside of lyrics. Like I, I do write down lyrics and notes app when I have like a flow going. So here's my question because, you know, I hear that a lot too, notes app, uh, you know, voice memos, but do you have any, and then Julie, I'll, I'll ask you the same thing uh, next, but Nick, is there any, type of organization with these because that songwriters I'm fascinated you have like thousands of these voice memos or notes and is there any method of organization so you can go back to them later you know uh for song ideas um I'll just try to remember like a general like like linear like timeline of like when I'm doing things and I'll be like hey I had an idea back in April that I want to go back to, I'll just like do it in that way and also give it a name that hopefully, you know, um, is able to uh, mark what it is. You know, if it's hard if it doesn't have lyrics to give something a name. So it'll be like, oh, like fuzzy riff, this or that, you know, so hopefully you can like mark it down in the moment so that you can find it later. Yeah. Uh, Julie, how about you? Are you, well, I guess, Julie, are you a pen and paper person or a computer person when it comes to lyrics? Um, definitely. Um, I feel like with lyrics, um, I'm more of a just sing them person. I, like I, I usually write the lyrics with the melody as I'm, as I'm working on the song. And so then I kind of have to remember what I'm saying, or I use like the words that are, that are coming, um, that, you know, I'll kind of use what I'm choosing as sometimes like a sort of steering direction of what the song is. Um, and then I'll go and write them down. But yeah, I'm I'm similar to Nick too with the voice memos where it's like, I think I did something good on August 29th, you know, stuff like that, you know, but they're usually, they're all titled like new idea, better, new idea, uh, second version. Um, you know, they all have extremely useless titles. Well, I interviewed Lauren Mayberry from churches like six months ago, and she said she has an extremely detailed Excel spreadsheet of all of her lyric ideas. Like it's the exact opposite of what you guys have said, that she has this Excel spreadsheet with all of these names, and that's her method of organization uh, mm -hmm. for those. And, I, and I, you know, I think people are surprised when songwriters tell me that that they're hyper organized i think most people would prefer that artists just these ideas come to them and then they just write them down but then a lot of them tell me that they have that super super organized filing system so um well i, I mean i oh no you go no go ahead please go ahead no i think i was just gonna say i feel like you have to you have to sort of like pick your your methods to the chaos. And I think for some people, it maybe it's that organization. And then I think, you know, for others, it's just kind of where, where you're going to put your emphasis and what, you know, what you have to trust, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, other songwriters who feel where, you know, they sort of have to like, they have to trust. I've heard a lot, like from other friends and stuff too. It's like, if you don't remember the melody the next day, then maybe it's not worth it. You know, so kind of trying hmm. to use that, like that memory kind of thing um, to sort of come back to stuff. There's just, yeah, there's there's so many methods to to the madness. I've heard that a lot, too, that idea that, hey, if it, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll be out, do, they'll be out doing something. And if it they can't remember an hour later, it probably wasn't, you know, meant to be. Um, so I interviewed uh, Britt Daniel from Spoon a few months ago, and he said he loves to go. 
I, I just have this image of him. It's fascinating. He goes to a bar with his laptop and listens to conversations. And when he hears certain lines or certain words, he writes them down. I just can imagine, you know, if you ever see Britt Daniel in the corner of the bar with a laptop, you know, beware <laughs> of what you're saying. So Nick, we'll start with you. Are there places, does that ever happen to you? How in tune are you to your environment when it comes for listening for certain things to write about, whether it's a line or something like that? I've never really done that in a voyeuristic way, <laughs> but a lot of my stuff comes from conversations with friends. A lot of um, song topics and, you know, phrases come from conversations and I'm definitely not an insular songwriter. Like I'm not really interested in being like confessional or like um, writing songs in like a bedroom pop mode. Like I'm more of a social person. I like writing about other people. I like writing about um, bigger ideas. So a lot of the stuff that I end up hitting upon is stuff that I've discussed with my, my friends. So when you hear something, you're probably pulling the phone out then. And it's like, oh, I got to write that down. Is it that kind of thing where you hear something you go, oh yeah, that sounds, I love that phrase. Yeah. That kind of stuff, or even just topics, or even if you're just discussing something that you're interested in and then you all of a sudden are like, Hmm, like that's actually interesting. Like maybe like there's a song that kind of like, like I kind of treat songwriting as like my outlet to like sound off on different things. So when you do that, then are you, when you sound off on those topics, those, those song ideas where you're really sounding off, do you revise a lot of those uh, lyrics or do you feel like, no, this was, it, it needs to be in the pure form because that was the most authentic. Um, I revise a lot. <laughs> you do. Yeah. 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 Because it's, you know, with, with music, there's a lot of, um, moving parts and phrasing and the way words sound together and just like to create like sort of like you know it, it's hard to have it all gel together like perfectly from from conversation because conversation's so informal and doesn't have like a you know a super heavy like um emphasis on like rhythm or anything like that yeah Julia, how about you? Are there, do you find yourself being in situations where you hear a phrase or you hear a word or something you go, oh yeah, that's, that's gotta be in a lyric somewhere. Mm, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a little bit less that way. Um, I, I think I like, and that's what I love about writing with Nick and being like on a, in a, like a songwriting partnership with Nick is I think that we bring different things to the table and um you know for me I would say I do one of like my best ways of like getting ideas and um thinking of lyrics is like walking and listening to music um and like walking and listening to music is like through New York City is probably like in my top two or three activities like just solo activities like if I have like an afternoon I love to just walk around and listen to music. Um, so words, you know, phrases and like thoughts will come to me through, um, through that experience, um, more than they come from than Yeah. Like listening to people or like looking in a, in a book, I think it would just, I think it would be hard. I, I mean, maybe it's something I should try more. I think it would be hard for me to feel like it was coming from a place, at least that I like understood you know, because I would feel, it would feel, I would think it would feel more like a project to do something like that. So you mentioned the role of movement and I, I hear that all the time I and mean, I'm a big runner. And so I get tons of ideas when I run and there's a lot of research behind this also, but something I hear songwriters tell me that they get a lot of ideas through walking, running, biking, hiking. Um, and it, you know, I've heard everywhere from the city to upstate New York, you know, it, 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 doesn't really matter where people are, but, but um, I do hear that a lot, that role of movement. So do you, do you find that you use that as a part of your process, Julie? And then I'll ask Nick this, but do you find that Julia, do you say, Hey, maybe if I go out and walk, this will help me work through these, an issue I'm stuck on when it comes to lyrics or music. I mean, do, I guess my question is, do you use that as a deliberate part of your process? 
Definitely. I mean, definitely. It's really easy to get jogged up or like stressed out about a song. And I think a really um, easy thing to do is, is to kind of move with it or like sing it like again, cause I think I have to do the movement of the, I kind of have to have the melody to, to find the words, but you know, actually talking about this is, is bringing up a point on the record that actually um, is kind of was inspired by by a, a conversation that I had with a friend of mine. And um, it's actually the song Post Love on the record where we were talking about, um, yeah, kind of like getting over this relationship and um, like this feeling where, you know, what, like trying to figure out what two people owe each other after something is, is done. And it's like one of my best friends, um, who I actually have written a lot of songs with before. And she said, the truth, you owe the truth. And then when we were, then it was like that phrase came back to me. And that's when we wrote that song. And I was like, it's the truth. You know, I don't, I don't know what that is. Cause it's like, I think that that, that word truth and um, the idea that you don't know even what it is, is kind of makes it kind of shows how truth can be something different for two people you know, and, and the fact that, that the idea of the truth might not really exist at all with the, with like the, the nuances. So, um, yeah, sorry, I kind of went on a tangent, no, but so, I, I did, I did realize it was like connected to what we were saying. Right. So you didn't, so that didn't, it wasn't when you heard her say that it sat, no. it was afterwards and you said, Oh yeah. I remember we had that conversation. Yeah. It was like weeks after that. I feel like along with like the movement thing, most, most times that I, I think I have a good idea is like the 30 minutes before you fall asleep. Okay. So I was going to ask this anyway. Um, and Nick, I will get to you about the movement, mm -hmm. but, but um, so there was a study I've been telling this to songwriters. There's a study that came out recently and in the study they talked about, and there's a term for that. There's a name for that period, I forgot what it is. Every time I tell the story, I forget, I need to go. There is a scientific term for that period right before you go to sleep, when you're in that kind of haze, you're not quite awake, but you're not asleep. So what, what they did in this study is they talked about Salvador Dali, the, plain, the painter. What he would do is he would hold a skeleton key. He'd sit in a chair and hold a skeleton key out at arm's length with a saucer, a teacup, saucer on the floor underneath it so when he was about to fall asleep what happened is he would let go of the key the key would make a loud noise it would wake him up and then he'd start to paint um and <laughs> so it, 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 it's interesting but there's a term for that and they actually they did find that people after in that space right after that space they are more creative than other times so there's there mm. yeah it's fascinating so so um yeah, Julia. So does that, you said, does that happen to you? It sounds like it does in that space right before sleep. It's very, yeah, it's very torturous because you have to decide if the idea is worth it for you to write it down yeah, um, or start singing it. But yeah, I feel like I've definitely, I definitely have a lot of like a lot more clarity in that kind of space and a lot more kind of freedom to just sort of, uh, just kind of see what's there. Um, and, and, and I, there's definitely been, there's been melody ideas and even song ideas that have come to me in dreams for sure. Yeah. All right, Nick, how about you? So how about the dreams first? Do you find that that's a good, fruitful, creative space for you? Honestly, it's usually more when I can't sleep and then I have to mull over something for like hours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for instance um we had we were um trying to make music videos for like six months and we didn't have any treatments that we liked and we were like down to the wire and i couldn't sleep because i was stressed out about this thing and i woke up or i i quit trying to sleep around like 4 a.m and went out into my living room and just like wrote out like the two video treatments in like 30 minutes because i had worried about them all night <laughs> so it's it's the insomnia then that's the most effective creative space for you yeah i was like i'm not going to be able to just settle down until i finally iron this out nick back to the movement then are you 
do you ever use movement in some form as a way to generate ideas? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, you know, it's, it's very random with me and I feel like I'm a pretty, like my creativity is like very like generative in a way where it needs like input. And Mm. for instance, like binging, like I binge a lot of media, like I'll listen to like tons of podcasts, read tons of articles, like watch tons of movies and listen to a lot of music to be able to like, sort of like, like doing that helps me be creative because I feel like a lot of my like creativity is generated by responding to media and being inspired by things. Hmm. So that's interesting because I've had, and I, you know, I wonder how much of this is pandemic related, but songwriters also always preface this with uh, people are going to kill me when I say this, but I get a lot of song ideas when I sit down with my guitar and watch Netflix, uh, you know, or watch television, you know, cause I guess they think that that's, that's not pure, right. You should, you can't be watching television and create songs, but you'd be surprised mm-hmm. how many have told me that, but then they immediately apologize because they feel like that's not the artistic way to do it. But so Nick, yeah. Does, yeah. So go ahead. Is that something that you do then uh, specifically maybe television? No, I don't watch a ton of TV. Oh. I, I, don't really ever watch Netflix, like television shows or anything like that. Like it's usually more, um, uh, fringe kind of stuff or, you know, like, and, and I think that people don't like that idea because it's not very romantic, but if you're in like this, like for me, I'm not really a person who works from like a place of like a blank space. Like, I don't like the way like Apple stores look, I like clutter and I like having stuff inside like, um, I guess like, you know, like nutritional stuff to like help, like, um, spark that creative energy. So it's not a white noise. It's actually, you are paying attention to those things. Yeah, I am paying attention. I guess it's like when you, like, if you ever went to an artist, like a painter's studio and they just have art books everywhere across the floor and like, you know, they're all like bookmarked because, they're um, finding inspiration in that source material. So, yeah. Um, so Julia and I'll ask Nick, I'll ask you this next, but Julia, when it comes to, I, I'm fascinated by the songwriters, by the ritual of the songwriter, whether it's time of day, place, things they have to have with them. The example I always tell people is, you know, I write in this chair, but I revise in the chair behind me. Uh, mm. that's, that's a, I find that I always have to revise in a different space that I create. Um, mm-hmm. and I, that's a part of my process and I know it, and that gives me confidence. So how important is, is the act of a ritual to your creative process? Well, I mean, I think like a really great ritual that I think that, that, that we have that has helped, um, help me individually as a songwriter. And, and I think help this album and just all of us as songwriters is that, you know, we do have this home base in Long Island. Um, and Olive in who's the, uh, drummer in Central Flower Bean, she really yeah. worked on, on, um, like she engineered a lot of the record and, um, she was kind of teaching herself a lot of that and kind of, she created an, an environment that made it very easy to demo and record. Um, so rather than, you know, kind of having to sit there with the instrument, you kind of sit, um, with the instrument right into the computer and start kind of using production as a um, songwriting tool. Um, And so I think, you know, during the pandemic, we had this ritual of being together basically five days a week from like 12 to five or six, give and take, and uh, just being together, seeing what would happen, you know, and, you know, that's a little kind of like the, the blank slate that Nick's talking about that is a little annoying, but it, because if you don't have anything, it's, it sucks. But um, a lot of times because of that, uh, just a lot more kind of out of the box ideas would happen, or we were writing from, you know, a place that wasn't about how we thought the songs would, what it would be like when they came out, you know, because every day it was just every day was a, it was a shot, you know, at, um, at finding a song. So, you know, like the song Stand By Me on the new record, again, I feel like 
the themes on that. And, you know, like that song wouldn't have been created without that routine that let us make something like every day. So you did have at least that routine was keeping regular hours, roughly regular hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But when you, so, uh, so when you write then, I mean, when you're writing maybe outside of that, you know, by yourself or anything like that, does Mm -hmm. it, do you, is there a certain time of day or place, you know, are you a morning person, night person? Does that matter at all to you? I'm definitely, I'm definitely a daytime writer just because I feel like I've been lucky enough to be like a working musician for so long that like day is is my is work and nighttime is 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 my friends and family and dog time party time (laughs) um so you know I I like I like giving myself the day to to see um what will happen but you know if you do you do like have to follow the inspiration if you don't you know you're in trouble and there's no way to predict when that's going to happen. So sometimes I do work at night too. Yeah. How about you, Nick? Is how important is the ritual to your creative process? Um, it's it's really hard to say. I, I would say not very important, actually. <laughs> because um I I we don't really, especially as a band, there is no formula and there's no wrong, like there's no reason to how we do anything. Like it's all very organic and as it happens. Like there isn't one specific way that we like write or, or record a song. So but I guess either you can answer this then when it when for this album, when you're coming together, when you do, when you're in that space, you know, the three of you, how does that work? Is there at least some ritual to, do you say, is there always this, do you always start with the same part of the process or is it just like, how does that actually, I'm curious, you sit down, the three of you, you're in that room is there something you always do to start off? If that makes sense. Yeah, not really. Um, Usually the most, the most like close, the closest thing I could say to like what happens is that there will be a piece of something most of the time. And sometimes there isn't, sometimes we just sit on instruments and try to pluck stuff up, pluck stuff out of the air. But usually, you know, it might be one word coming from Julia, or it might be one piece of music coming from Olive, or it might be an entire song where I know how I want it to sound in the end. And I know that I just want Julia to play bass on it in the exact way that she plays bass. And I play everything else on it. So it's there really is no like set way that we write and there is no set way that the songs are concocted. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I know that's a great answer. I, and that's, I know it makes it complicated to talk about because it really is super varied. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there and, are songs where they're not very personal and me and Julia can go through them together and look at each lyric and like try to, um, go through the lyrics and add lines. And then other songs are too personal for that process. So then, We just leave the other, the other person needs their, you know, um, agency to like, you know, if if you have a song like that, it's, it's less of a spot where you can be collaborative in that way because it's more personal. Yeah. And I, I do think that we have, you know, we do have, it's fun to, it's fun to work together because we have a different strengths, you know, and I think that maybe sometimes we annoy each other with what we're trying to get done, but I do think it's still like a really fun process. And I'm usually the one kind of like, I'm usually like thinking about the structure a lot and trying to make sure that all the, you know, like I'm kind of like trying to see the whole thing like a puzzle. Um, and I think Nick is, um, you know, I'm like just trying to make sure that we're that like the initial spark is maintained. Yeah. Do you, I guess, how do you do that? How do you try to maintain that initial spark? Is it, do you, will you work like if something happens, if you get that spark, do you just work for long stretches, you know, to build that momentum? Yeah, totally. I think if things are going well, then you're not going to want to stop. Once you start hitting walls, I think 
you can either, you know, sometimes you can work through them or other days you just need to take a break and like maybe listen to some music or do something else and come back to it. Um, when we were making this record, um, a big emphasis was just on having fun and not being guarded and not being embarrassed by anything and not holding on to anything too tightly because when I was younger, it was really hard for me to write songs. And if I had something that I liked, I would strangle it because I was so protective of it. And over the course of working on this third album, we all sort of learned to like, maybe like loosen our grips and let things change and let things move on. And we ended up having a ton of songs because of that. And our producer, JP, who wasn't with us, we'd worked remotely for most of the record. He was the curator. And if something didn't really strike his fancy, like you would just move on and you'd forget about it. You'd have to swallow your ego and just be hopeful that tomorrow you'll write a song that is interesting to him. <laughs> so, Nick, is there an ideal emotion when you tend to get your best writing done? Uh, how is, you know, it, yeah, is there an ideal emotion where you're at your most prolific, whether it's happiness or sadness or anything like that? I think, I think it's palpable, like excitement, like for instance, when we did in flight, there's like a certain kind of energy and like brisk, like, um, like, like almost like a mania where it's like, yes, this is like really coming together. This is going to be an important song for us. This is one of the best things I've ever done and you'll get it done really quickly. And it's like, there's no struggle. You can clearly see the finish line. And in flight was one of those where basically in a day, the whole thing was done. And then mm -hmm. there are other songs where it's a little bit more of a process and you know, there's something really great there and you're trying to get to it. And maybe that would be more like a song, like, um, who put you up to this where, you know, for a long time, we knew there was something really great there, but maybe it was a little bit more difficult to get it to the point that it got to. So I actually have a quote written down by a novelist, and it's exactly what you're saying. E.L. Doctorow, he said, and this is perfect for what you just told me. He said, writing is like driving at night. You can only see as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Uh, <laughs> right? And isn't that, like yeah. some, isn't that great? Some songs, you know the finish line. Others... Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Are, sometimes it's broad daylight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... Boy, he should have added that part to it, right? Driving at... <laughs> yeah. Um, so Julie, how about you? Is there an ideal emotion when you tend to get your best writing done? I mean, I think, um, I think I'm usually writing from a more melancholy place, which is kind of sad, but I, I do think that, you know, being a songwriter is a very specific way of interpreting life. You know, it's kind of like a coping mechanism. And I don't know, I don't necessarily, I don't think anyone will particularly know why it is that um, a lot, some emotions are, are better, better served in a song or that there are things that can be expressed in a song that can never be expressed through words and can never be expressed on paper because it's an experience that you're, that you're giving someone. It's a, it's a feeling. Um, but I will say, you know, we, we did, we did write this song a couple of years ago called moment in the sun that, um, is like, I would say it's like the, uh, one of the only like happy, truly happy, wholesome places that I ever wrote a song from. And it just got used in this great TV show and, and, uh, it moment is having its moment and it's definitely made me think, um, more about other places that. I should spend more time as a songwriter thinking about because kids have really been responding to the song and getting a lot of happiness from it, which is really the point and makes me love the song so much more because I feel like it's doing the thing that it was meant to do. Yeah, that's yeah. And I think some songwriters tell me, or, you know, for me, at least as a writer, I think there's a, there's a limit, right? If you're too melancholy, it's hard to write from that space. Uh, yeah. So all right, a couple more questions. I forgot to follow this up. We talked about movement, but I think people being coop, cooped up for the past two years, uh, a lot of songwriters have told me they've gotten song ideas doing mundane activities like gardening, 
uh, vacuuming, cleaning, doing the dishes, chopping vegetables, something about a mundane activity that requires no brain power allows their creative brain to kind of get energized. So both of you, I'm curious, has that ever happened to you? We've gotten a song idea or a melody or something like that doing one of those brainless mundane ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I maybe. Have... Sorry, go ahead, Jules. No, no, I was going to say, I was going to say a silly thing, which is not exactly the question you're asking, but, um, you know, I think taking antidepressants, I think, um, has, was it, is, it has been a huge positive, um, for me at the time I've, you know, I've taken them on and off for many years. And I think that, you know, treating, <laughs> treating your different mental you know, problems or, or, or areas that are, that's, that you struggle with, you know, it just, it's just that stigma, you know, where people, um, and especially artists feel, I think a, a lot of times that they have to be connected, like you said, to, you know, to that kind of sadness or that melancholy of work. But I do think the very mundane act of, you know, taking, taking medication, which can, you know, can feel stressful, but a lot of times is life-saving and is, um, how you actually get creative work done. You know, like you said, you can't be creative when you're too sad or you're too yeah. depressed. You, you can't get anything done, you know? So. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, I do find that songwriters are relatively voracious readers. Uh, so I'm curious, Julia, how much uh, reading do you get to do? And uh, does that ever, it, do you ever get song ideas does that ever influence your uh, songwriting process? Yeah, it definitely. It definitely does. I mean, I've been, I've been like reading some, I've been reading some, um, Joan Didion essays when my mom is calling me, but it just went away. Um, I've been reading some Joan Didion essays, which is really good, but also, um, I totally unrelated. I've been like tr trying to read a little bit more nonfiction and I'm reading a book about the history of dinosaurs and like paleontology. Um, so, you know, I, I'm maybe, maybe some dinosaur stuff will, will happen. Um, like a, 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 a dinosaur, a dinosaur album, you know, I think that would be really cool. We're going to mark this time because when that album comes out, we're going to say, you said it here first, the, the dine influence. I love that answer, by the way. I've never, I mean, um, I've heard Joan Didion a lot, but never, uh, but never dinosaurs. Um, well, can, I tell you, can I tell you the problem that I'm finding with reading a dinosaur book? is that you have to go back to the computer to look up all like the pictures and like get more context. You know, it's like, I feel like I should be watching a documentary, but I do love- You need more pictures out. in your dinosaur book. I need more <laughs> pictures in my dinosaur book. I do. I, you know, if I'm not seeing the dinosaur, you know- There's gotta be a children's- out. There's gotta be a ch children's book out there you can buy for like $5 that will have those pictures. But it won't be as, it won't be historically in depth. You know, that's true. I'm, no, no, I'm, I have it next to it. So you so oh, just have mentioned. it next. Yeah. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought you. I thought you were making fun of me. And just oh no, not history. at all, not at all. No, I'm thinking like okay. it's too much work to go to the internet and research. You just have that kid's book next to you, and you say, "Oh yeah, what's that? Oh, there's a picture of it." You know. Well, it's it, uh, you know it's interesting thinking about like early, you know, you know sometimes you you want you got to Google these pictures of these like early sort of amphibious creatures you know you can't find them in a you know in and you a gotta book. spell just, it the right way that's the hardest spell part it the right way right. yeah totally. um uh so do you try to read every day i do i do try it doesn't happen all the time yeah um, um yeah nick how about you are you a uh how often do you get to read um i listen to audiobooks more than i read but i listen to audiobooks almost every day do you have favorite authors or genres that you like? Um, I read a lot of, I, I mean, well, I listen to a lot of, you know, the new fiction writers that, you know, everybody reads, you know. I, I think that um, songwriting is a little bit, it's actually something that I, I was con like kind of trying to do with this album is right in a way that's closer to how millennial writers write more than how songwriters write. Because I think songs aren't really, for the most part, sort of dealing with the kind of things that I'm interested in right now. And I'm fine, I, I find that a lot more 
like authors are sort of diving into like things in a, in a way that is more interesting to me and a little bit deeper because songs can be most of the time limited in like the scope of what they're about, you know, breakup songs, love songs, songs about, you know, um, you know, like more sort of like not storytelling exactly, but almost more observational in a way, almost like, almost like the way comedians write jokes. Yeah. So it sounds like, does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. But it sounds like you're directly influenced then like the stuff that you hear, you're that directly influences your songwriting or you, you, you hope it does. Yes. I mean, yeah, I, I I just was, yeah, I feel like maybe I just, I don't know, over the pandemic, I just didn't feel like a lot of the music that was coming out or that I was listening to was like speaking a lot to um, what I was interested in. And that's it for the latest episode of Songwriters on Process. Don't forget, you can find all of my interviews with over 200 songwriters on my Songwriters on Process website at songwritersonprocess.com, going all the way back to 2010. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.